Um, this session on NAFTA and continental energy politics will feature Michelle Betzel, who will speak on NAFTA as a forum for carbon dioxide permit trading, question mark. Um, Simone Palva from Brown, energy and climate politics in Mexico, in Rollins from the University of Waterloo in Canada, renewable energy politics across borders. And Joe Duker to my right, who is an independent energy analyst from Washington, who's done a lot of work on energy and NAFTA, will discuss. So, over to Michelle. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you again to all the organizers for inviting me to this. Um, one of the challenges of, of going last is that I've listened to all these presentations over the last day, and, and I want to engage in lots of different conversations, and so I have all kinds of margin notes um, on my paper, and I, I'll try to stay on task on my topic, but um, I think there's lots of interesting overlaps, and, and I think that's pretty exciting. My paper deals with um, a very preliminary discussion, and I use the word discussion pretty loosely, um, within the North American Commission for Environmental Cooperation, the CEC, which is the environmental organ of NAFTA, as many of you probably know, about establishing a CO2 permit trading system, a cap-and-trade system, um, primarily to deal with the environmental impacts of electricity generation, and I'll come back to that issue. Um, again, I don't want to give you the impression that this is something that's on the table, it's, it's being debated, it's, you know, a hot topic. Um, this may be more of an exercise in kind of thinking about alternative futures, um, in fact, but we'll engage it nevertheless. I'll introduce a little bit what the discussion in the CEC has been, to the extent that there has been a discussion. Um, and then I want to address three sets of issues related to this idea of having kind of a NAFTA-wide and a NAFTA-based CO2 permit trading system. And the first has to do with the institutional context, the way the rules and practices of the CEC and NAFTA might kind of constrain the way we frame the issue, um, the types of rules that would need to be followed. I then want to turn to some de design elements and talk about potential conflicts between environmental integrity and economic efficiency. And then the third section, I want to talk about how this uh, CEC-based trading system might overlap and interact with some of the other trading systems that we've heard people talk about in North America and Europe, and I think there's some interesting questions there. Um, so again, even if, if this isn't a cutting-edge topic, if this isn't something that's, you know, actively being pursued, I think it helps raise issues that have, have been touched on in a variety of the, the um, other presentations in terms of issue framings and particularly the political conflicts that can arise, particularly when you have an increasingly institutionally dense kind of climate policy um, arena. So the CC and, and, and permit trading. Again, climate change is not more than really a blip on the radar screen in the, in the CEC. It's, the CEC does address some issues, environmental issues directly, um, biodiversity, toxic pollutants. There have been a couple of resolutions passed by the CEC Council, which consists of the environmental ministers of each member state, um, calling for coordination on, on greenhouse gas emissions inventories. Um, that's about it. Climate-related issues have been taken up in some of the program areas of the CEC. Um, so there is work on, on renewable energy, on um, standardizing air quality management standards, um, but again, not directly rationalized in terms of, of climate change. The, the discussion, the, the mention of CO2 permit trading, essentially, that, that I'm going to be dealing with, came up in the context of trying to mitigate the environmental impacts of the electricity sector. And in 2000, the CEC launched an initiative, um, and, and their goal was to address the challenge of ensuring affordable and abundant supply of energy, so energy security, without compromising environmental and, and health objectives. Um, and so it was really trying to, to address the environmental aspects of an increasingly regionalized and increasingly integrated North American electricity market, where demand is expected to go up dramatically, particularly in Mexico, um, so generation capacity is going to increase, and how to manage the environmental impacts of that. And CO2 has been identified as, as one of the kind of things that might need to be addressed. And, and here again, the link to climate change, even though it's not being made explicitly, um, it is certainly there. This is that energy climate link that we've been talking about um, the last day or so. And if you look at the role of electricity generation in overall CO2 emissions for each of the member states, you'll see that it's a significant source of, of CO2 emissions. So, again, this is, is very much climate-related, even though it's not climate-directed. So in 2000, the CEC launched this um, initiative. They organized an advisory board, background papers, and they issued a, 
report in 2002 entitled The Environmental Challenges and Opportunities of the Evolving North American Electricity Market. Um, and Joe Dukert actually had a, a pretty heavy hand in, in writing this report. And in this report, kind of buried in, in the back, the advisory board made a suggestion that um, the CEC consider um, developing a standard emissions inventory um, protocol and establish a framework for a regional trading system. And this idea was then picked up and, and put into the 2003 um, air quality work plan. And in 2004, the CEC issued a report detailing um, air pollutant emissions from all power plants in North America. And they included CO2, sulfur dioxide, <coughs> NOx, and mercury. So this is really the context in which any sort of discussion is, is taking place. The first issue I want to think about is, is what are the implications of, of CO2 permit trading, of talking about the issue in the particular institutional context of the CEC and NAFTA more broadly? And, and what I want to suggest here is that this institutional context shapes how CO2 emissions are, are discussed, the framing of the issue, as well as setting some ground rules that, that mean the design of a program ha would have to look in a, a particular way. Turning first to the CEC, um, Several studies of emissions trading in general, and here I think um, the report that Andrew and, and Stacy and others did um, identified this pretty clearly. It's fundamentally important that there be some sort of a political agreement to control emissions to have a successful emissions trading um, program. Probably seems a little bit self-evident. So, so what is the ability of the CEC to facilitate a political agreement to control CO2 emissions? Um, as a foundation for establishing an emissions trading system. And, and here, you know, there's clearly a problem in the fact that CEC member states, U.S., Canada, and Mexico, do not have any clear common understanding or common policy on climate change. You have countries that have distinctly different national approaches to climate change, um, have, not, have independently developed their national policies without regard to what others are doing, um, have not coordinated their engagement in the international uh, processes, have different relationships to the international process. There's kind of no, it's not clear what the foundation is there on which the CEC could build. And here it's particularly important to note that the CEC is very weak institutionally. It's an intergovernmental organization. Somebody yesterday I think called it toothless. Um, it, it, it is there to serve the interests of its member states. It does not have any authority over its member states, could not kind of push harmonization if the member states don't if that's not what they want. And, and in that way, it's very different from the EU, for example. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of seems to be a, a problem. The benefit, however, of dealing with issues in a regional body like the CEC, which deals with lots of different issues, is that you can then link issues. So if, if okay, nobody really cares about climate change, but we can link it to other issues that they, are, they do care about. And this is what Susie was talking about in terms of finding what, what would resonate. In the CEC, it seems that, that there's an opportunity to link climate change to air quality and energy security. And, and that's exactly you know, what we, we kind of see happening. Um, so, so CO2 emissions in this context are framed as an air pollutant rather than a greenhouse gas linked to climate change. Um, and it's striking to look at some of the reports. Um, CO2 is mentioned as a greenhouse gas, but the link between greenhouse gases and climate change is never mentioned. Um, the word climate change doesn't, doesn't come out at all. Um, in the electricity report, they highlighted the specific impacts of sulfur dioxide, of, of NOx and mercury, um, but said only of CO2 emissions that they are of global concern wherever they are emitted. So, you know, they're really trying to not talk about CO2 as, as climate change. This is an air pollutant. Um, and I'll come back to the significance of that framing. The other key piece of the institutional context, of course, is, is the NAFTA factor, that, that the CEC is situated in NAFTA, and NAFTA's primary objective is trade liberalization. Um, the CEC does not question the goal of trade liberalization. It simply is trying to manage environmental impacts um, associated with trade liberalization. And so um, I'll come back to this as well, is what happens then when you have um, conflicts between economic efficiency and environmental integrity. Um, and it's important to remember that it's you know, trade liberalization is the fundamental purpose of NAFTA. Um, and NAFTA also has some very specific rules about um, trading and the electricity sector that would have to be taken into account. So 
how our, our allowances forms of subsidies, and if they're forms of subsidies, what, what are the implications of that? Um, how does purchase of, of credits across national borders relate to investment, and, and would it fall under Chapter 11 rules, um, et cetera? And, and I'm not an expert on, on this area, but people tell me these are um, things that we would need to think about. So the, again, the point here is that the institutional context kind of constrains the way we can talk about CO2 emissions and the types of rules if, if one were to move forward to develop a CO2 emissions program. That leads me to think about design elements. Um, again, this is pretty straightforward. The design of an emissions trading system affects its environmental integrity and its economic efficiency. And so what I want to look at is, is some aspects of, of designing an emissions trading system and particular whether and how there are conflicts between environmental integrity and, and economic efficiency. Um, for time, I'm really going to focus on the, the first category, coverage, what gases would be included, um, what sectors of the economy could be included in a, in a NAFTA-wide CEC-based um, climate uh, CO2 emissions trading system. If you look at, there's one estimate says there's, there's something like 45 CO2 trading systems out there um, worldwide, and, and a survey of that says that roughly half of them, um, in terms of the gases that they cover, include all six what are called the Kyoto gases. And so it's not just CO2, it's, it's the range of, of gases. And, and this, there's an economic efficiency argument and an environmental integrity argument. The economic efficiency argument is that you then give participating facilities the option to choose between different gases, and they may have lower cost options for dealing, for reducing emissions of one type of gas and, and not others, and so you're, you're giving flexibility and allowing to look for low cost options. Um, and for climate, the environmental integrity argument is, is they all have global warming potentials, um, so reducing any of these is, is contributing to addressing the problem of climate change. Other systems have said, well, that's, yes, that may be true, but we don't have the capacity to monitor all of these things, to measure them, and so about the other half focused just on CO2. So what might we envision for, seriously, what, what, what might we envision <laughs> for um, a CEC-based system? And here, because of this air pollution framing, um, it, you know, obviously you're not going to get all six Kyoto gases. There's no, there would be no justification for including methane, for example, um, in terms of air quality. So, but the economic efficiency argument would suggest you need a basket of gases. So you would likely get CO2, sulfur dioxide, um, and NOx, and give facilities the option to trade off between them. Um, and in terms of climate protection, that raises a problem. Of if, if facilities routinely decide to focus on sulfur dioxide, for example, um, does that have CO2 reduction benefits? Sometimes it might. There might be co-benefits. But there may also be instances where it doesn't. And so in terms of climate protection, including a basket of gases, has environmental integrity um, problems. But again, NAFTA's focus on trade liberalization is likely to mean that conflict gets resolved in favor of economic efficiency. Um, in terms of sectors, the electricity sector, you know, this is where the discussion is talking about. It would include the electricity sector. This actually makes sense in terms of environmental integrity and balancing economic efficiency. You get a pretty um, relatively manageable sector, um, but that has high impacts on CO2 emissions. So, but it would then raise issues about how you deal with hydro and, and renewable portfolio standards. All right. So the last issue, um, and unfortunately this is one I think is most interesting, and I'm out of time. Um, and, and what we've seen is there's an increasingly dense institutional kind of um, architecture in North America dealing with climate change. And what happens when you have this is, is these things begin, policies and, and practices begin to overlap. And I think there's been a, a tendency to assume that's good, that that'll just reinforce things. And in fact, I think we need to look more closely and, and see how these things overlap and see where there are potential conflicts. And so this is just a list of, of seven CO2 permit trading systems that are either in operation or under discussion in North America. And what I've done is tried to kind of map out how they overlap. Most of them focus on electricity generation, the, electri um, the electricity generation sector. In some cases, these are reinforcing. So if you imagine an installation situated in New Hampshire, um, it has regulations under New Hampshire state law um, situated within REGI, which is actually there to facilitate the ability of New Hampshire to achieve its own target. 
Though that's complementary. That that may work okay. Um, I'm not. I'm graphically impaired, so the whole point here is that this should look messy. Um, <laughs> But once you start putting all these other systems, that installation in New Hampshire all of a sudden might find itself facing conflicting regulations. And in political science, we often talk about when, when you face conflicting regulations, there's an incentive to venue shop. Look for the system that's going to you know, least cost and give you the most benefits, where your interest is going to be served the best. Um, and it's not, you know, a CEC-based system may actually be attractive for the energy um, generation sector because it would cover everybody, so it levels the competitive um, playing field, and because it's rationalized in terms of air pollution, <coughs> you might have lower CO2 reduction standards than you have in some of the others. So there's actually a danger that setting up a CEC system could undermine other systems which are more directly aimed at mitigating the issue of climate change. And so I think that's that creates all sorts of interesting political conflicts that um, we should talk about as well. Um, there's also overlap between the CEC and a Kyoto system, and, and I think people have talked about the fact that Canada is in this kind of awkward position of having a Kyoto commitment that it probably won't reach, but um, under the Kyoto rules, credits purchased from installations in the U.S. could not be counted as providing progress towards meeting the, the Kyoto target. Um, so that's another conflict that um, we would have to deal with. So in terms of the question I started with, NAFTA as a, as a um, forum for CO2 permit trading, um, I question the wisdom that, and maybe it's a good thing that there's not a, a stronger discussion, but I think because of the framing of in terms of broader air quality and energy issues um, could dilute the impact of this on the problem of climate change. I think it might be interesting to think about it in terms of air quality. Um, and because it's situated within the broader NAFTA regime and, and this fundamental goal of trade liberalization, I think there's just, just some problems and, and challenges there. Um, and the last point that I made, that, that it could potentially undermine more direct efforts to address climate change that we've heard so much about over the, the past days, that I'm not sure there's a lot of value added. Um, at this point. So, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> yeah. Who's next, Simone? Yeah. Hello, hello, my name is Simone Pulver I'm with Brown University, uh, the Watson Institute for International Studies. And my talk today is going to be about energy and climate politics in Mexico. And so when you're doing research, you generally need to answer the so what question, why should we care? And it seems to me that um, when you study the U.S., you can get away with not answering that question because you're studying the U.S. However, when you study Mexico, and in particular in this context, I actually think I need to justify why you should care about uh, the information I'm going to present. And I'm going to give three reasons. One is I think no matter what happens with the Kyoto Protocol, internationally we're moving towards a direction of, or at least a conversation about greenhouse gas targets, not only for developed countries, but also for developing countries. And Mexico, as well as South Korea, are at the top of the list of potential developing countries that would take on targets because they are members of the OEDC, and they're the only two members of the OEDC that, OECD, sorry, that uh, um, haven't taken on targets under the um, international climate change system. So that's one reason why we should care about what's going on in Mexico. Two, I think that sort of given the pre-existing collaboration or the institutional architecture that exists linking Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, it's a likely place to look for what an integrated climate regime might look like. And by integrated, I mean a climate regime that includes both developed and developing countries. And then finally, I think the Mexico case I don't want to say it's representative of all developing countries, not at all, but I still think it's interesting to understand the dynamics that shape climate, take, climate change politics in a developing country situation. Just really briefly, sort of big context. Um, so the two key features of Mexico in the sort of general politics or on the sort of general climate change terrain are one, Mexico is an oil exporter, has been a net oil exporter, is a big oil producing country, so that obviously factors into it. Also, um, 
is very concerned about vulnerability. In part, it's a very uh, diverse country in sort of ecological diversity. It's one of 12 mega diverse countries um, identified around the world. And I mean, this is you know, a really broad brush, sort of two identifying characteristics about Mexico to know about. For people who are interested in a much more detailed understanding of the Mexico context, Mexico's national greenhouse gas inventory is available online. Mexico's produced two national communications about its climate change um, policies via the UNFCC framework, and those are available online as well. So I encourage people um, to look at that. Um, it's funny, listening to uh, the talks yesterday and today, there's a ways in which Mexico and Canada are actually quite similar, right? The concern with vulnerability, the oil exporters. And just if you think about these countries in a comparative perspective, also on CO2 emissions, Mexico and Canada are sort of in the same ballpark. The U.S. obviously in a totally different um, <laughs> arena. <laughs> um, of course, once you look at uh, CO2 emissions per capita, that changes, right? Canada and the U.S. have a lot more in common than Mexico, but just to sort of give you a sense in the comparative perspective. Um, so my goal today is to talk about the terrain of climate change politics in Mexico. And in some ways, it's sort of to understand the history of how the climate change issue has evolved, sort of which <laughs> Um, institutional or spheres or arenas have had control of the issue as a way to understand how politics might go forward in the future. And basically I'm going to talk about four sectors or four arenas, the scientific research community, um, and just I'm going to be using a lot of acronyms and so this is the slide that introduces them. Um, UNAM is the university, the National University in Mexico. INE is a research institute that's part of the Mexican EPA or basically Mexico's equivalent of the EPA, which is an organization called SEMARNOT. Um, CENER is the uh, Ministry of Energy. PEMEX is Petroleos Mexicanos, Mexico's national oil company. So it is a, you know, sort of a, one of those hybrid organizations of industry actor, but also part of the government. CFAA is Mexico's um, electricity company, also <coughs> one of those hybrid and industry actor, but uh, part of the national government. And then civil society, there's a whole bunch of Mexican NGOs. The two that might potentially work on climate change are um, the Unión de Grupos Ambientales, Ambientalistas, the UGA, and then SEMDA, which is sort of a Mexican equivalent of NRDC, or Environmental Defense. Okay. I'm going to give away the punchline right now. In terms of where the action has been, it's been in the scientific community, in the government sector, in SEMARNOT and then actually surprisingly in the business and industry community. So basically up till 1992 when Mexico signed the UNFCC, it was pretty much the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that um, controlled this issue. But then in 1993 the U.S. In initiated this program called the U.S. Country Studies Program, um, George Bush Sr. I mean, it was initiated in part in, before the Rio Earth Summit and as, as a way to sort of balance the negative role that the U.S. played at the Rio Earth Summit. This was sort of a little, uh, see, we are doing something on climate change. And it was a program that identified certain developing countries and offered them technical and financial assistance um, to, in this case, sort of do research in three main areas. One, a greenhouse gas inventory. Two, mitigation scenarios, or scenarios of emissions and mitigation potential. And then three, to study vulnerability. And this country studies program actually had a really significant effect on how climate change politics evolved in Mexico. One, these technical results, right? Mexico's greenhouse gas inventory was a result of this country studies funding. But more importantly, there are also political results. What it created was this cadre of research scientists, climate scientists, and some environmental bureaucrats that basically, through this country studies program, claimed ownership of the climate change issue. And they sort of, and this was, you know, you could argue this was in the agenda setting phase. And so the key actors during this agenda setting phase that sort of set um, Mexico on sort of the climate policy path it would take were environmental scientists and environmental bureaucrats. And in particularly in UNAM, the National University, and then in INE, this research institute. 
this community of actors pretty much controlled the climate change issue until 1997, where with the sort of negotiations um, for Kyoto at the international level, the issue also gained in political profile within Mexico, and that's when other agencies, not just the environmental agency, but the energy ministry, um, transportation, commerce, got engaged in the issue. What I wanted to show um, with this slide, and I'm potentially also graphically challenged, <laughs> is uh, what, when you think or you look at sort of government action in Mexico on climate change, it's been this really stop and go process. So that there's this building of momentum through the country <coughs> studies program. But then because in 1997 and then 1998 all these other ministries got involved in the climate change issue, it got to be a very contentious issue. <coughs> particularly the energy ministry, was um, a real <coughs> advocate against action on climate change, so opposition, an oppositional voice in the debates. However, there was this battle between CENER, the energy ministry, CEMARNAT, the environmental ministry, um, around ratification. In the end, in 2000, the Mexican Senate voted to ratify Kyoto, the Kyoto Protocol. The casting vote was um, President Cedillo, who um, ended up siding with the environmental ministry, so ratification, another sort of push forward. Unfortunately, Zadillo did this in the last year of his six-year term. <laughs> um, there was a kind of, at that same time, there was a national climate action strategy that got set up. However, he left office. Vincente Fox came into office, was not interested in the climate issue. And um, pretty much, um, the issue had been sort of still with INE. He sort of removed the issue from INE's, focused more on Semarnat, but a real slowdown because of the changeover in administration. Then, of course, the U.S. pulls out of Mexico. I mean, <laughs> pulls out of... Um, <laughs> <laughs> pulls out of the Kyoto Protocol in 2001. That was a real um, sort of damper on Mexican thinking on this because, of course, Mexico was thinking through the CDM and other mechanisms it would be able to, it would be one source where the U.S. would be buying a lot of its credits. Um, however, um, Vincente Fox then had a sort of re, uh, an epiphany in some ways about this. When the EU ratified the Kyoto Protocol, he appointed a new secretary for the environment. So in 2002, we have this upsurge of interest again. Basically, this stop and go process. I'd say right now, it's once again in a more stop hover phase where there's just, uh, there's a lot of interministerial conflict um, and, and competition over control of this issue, right? Should it be in Semarnat? Should it be in Senair? Who owns this issue? Okay. So that's on the government side. Civil society, I think, I don't want to sort of uh, knock the amount of environmental activism that's happening in Mexico. There's lots of, there's a really vibrant civil society. However, not very many organizations that have the capacity, the technical expertise to work on climate change, right? Climate change is a really complex issue. And then also the, uh, the feeling is that, you know, it's not, it's not a priority issue for most Mexicans, right? Local air pollution, that's a priority issue. Sort of democratic accountability, that's a priority issue that um, NGOs work on. So really you haven't seen any sort of strong impetus out of the NGO sector in terms of this issue. Where there has been a lot of action is actually among business and industry actors. And in particular, um, so and to me this is surprising. It's not necessarily when you're looking, when I was thinking about sort of developing countries and where you might see action or a voice on climate change in developing countries. This is not necessarily the most obvious place. However, there has been leadership and it's followed a pattern of collaboration between a US or an international NGO and a key business actor in Mexico. And the best example of this is Pemex. So Pemex is Petroleos Mexicanos. It's um, a state-owned oil company, right? So it's actually a government agency, although it um, works semi-independently as well. It's the sixth largest oil company in the world, so it's a big player. Pemex is a big player globally in the um, oil industry arena. And in, the, in December of 1999, as a huge surprise, Pemex came out in favor of precautionary action on climate change. One of the reasons that's a huge surprise is because no other developing country, state-owned oil company, has come anywhere close to this. 
right? I mean, we think about OPEC, Saudi Aramco. Those, those are the countries that are, are the companies that are just staunchly opposed to any kind of action on climate change. So Pemex really broke ranks in a significant way. Um, sort of so that the announcement came up in 1999 and then in 2001 it also uh, announced that it as a company was going to take on an emissions reductions target. It was a 1% target um, by the end of the year. So, by, so in June 2001 they announced that by the end of the year they would have reduced their emissions from their process, uh, their processes basically by 1%. There was at that time talk of a 10% reduction by 2010. That's pretty much fallen off the table. They haven't followed up on that. But really Pemex has come out as a leader for action on climate change. <coughs> And then also along with this, um, taking on this 1% greenhouse gas reduction target, Pemex joined Environmental Defense's Partnership for Climate Action. And that's actually a big part of the story because when you look at why Pemex has been a leader on climate change, I make the argument that they've done this, what I call importing environmentalism. As an oil company, they have this self-identity of they're not a leader in the international oil industry, but a close follower, and they look to the leaders and decide which company is the leading company and then copy their practices. Not surprisingly, they look to BP as the leader of um, oil company action on climate change, and the links two BP were actually facilitated, once again, through U.S. influence. There was a U.S. AID project that brought folks from Pemex to Washington, D.C. for a meeting to look at market-based mechanisms um, for dealing with environmental issues. At that meeting, they met folks from environmental defense and then put them in touch with BP. And that goes a long way to explaining how Pemex formulated its climate policy and then the particular shape that the climate policy took. Finally, um, I don't think the Pemex story would have been possible. There are four facilitating conditions. One, that Mexico in general, despite this stop and go pattern, has been an advocate for international, at the international level for action on climate change. So if Mexico had been a Saudi Arabia, this wouldn't have, been, uh, this wouldn't have happened. Two, Pemex, when it started formulating its climate change policy, even though it's part of the energy ministry, or sort of yeah, loosely affiliated with the energy ministry, actually got its initial cues from the environmental ministry and from INE because Pemex was pulled into that country studies research program. So in some ways it got its cues from the, those environmental scientists and bureaucrats that set the agenda initially. If it hadn't gotten those cues, I don't think this would have been, uh, uh, this, this sort of climate friendly policy would ever have evolved. Fine, uh, third, um, the climate policy and the particular elements of the climate policy fit pre-existing business objectives within Pemex, which are about efficiency and access to foreign investment, or a way of bringing foreign investment into the company. <coughs> and then finally, Pemex's leadership was open to this. Um, Fernando de la Garza, who uh, is the head of Pemex's environmental program, actually came from the nuclear industry, and he had been the target of this environmental campaign that was quite successful against nuclear power plants, and sort of brought that into the picture. Okay, so to conclude, what does this mean in terms of bringing Mexico on board? Although I'm learning um, at this conference that very few countries seem to be interested in bringing Mexico on board, <laughs> um, which, you know, is, I think important to realize, but if there's an interest in sort of collaborating with folks on Mexi in Mexico, I think one thing, sort of a couple key lessons. One, what happens in Mexico is really responsive to what Annex I countries are doing, right? So, what, you know, the U.S. pullout really sort of killed action on climate change in Mexico. That's one part. Another obstacle, I think, right now to forward action is that there isn't a lead agency. I mean, in some ways, Semarnat is where climate change is housed, <coughs> but still, it's the issue is sort of contested by all these different agencies, and there's this interministerial battle going on. So that's, an, I think, a, an obstacle. In terms of potential partners, I think most likely potential partners are going to be in the private sector or business and industry actors. And I don't know if um, Andrew from WRI is still here, but the, uh, WRI and through the WBCSD has actually done some interesting work on corporate um, greenhouse gas inventories in Mexico just recently. So I, d you know, that's that's where the um, 
future potential lies. Thank you very much. Ian, over to you. Thank you very much. My name is Ian Rollins. I'm a faculty member at the University of Waterloo, which is located north of the border, about an hour west of Toronto. And first of all, many thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this session over these couple of days. It's been very interesting and uh, uh, learned much and look forward to continuing the discussions. The title of my presentation today is Renewable Energy Politics Across Borders. And the purpose I've written out there is to investigate cross-border Canada-US political issues that are arising and could arise with respect to desires to increase the use of renewable electricity. So a couple of qualifiers moving from the title to the purpose of the presentation. First of all, when I'm talking about borders, I'm interested in particular the relationship between Canada and the United States. And secondly, when I'm talking about energy, I recognize that I go to a important, though not, not only subset of energy and looking particularly at electricity and investigating these issues. So to try to achieve the purpose of the presentation, I've divided my comments into three main parts. First of all, I'll try to provide a little bit of the context by talking about how discussions regarding renewable electricity are fitting in within uh, broader discussions about global climate change policy. I'll also try to provide a bit of the context by talking briefly about Canada, United States electricity trade and relations more broadly. Secondly, move on talk about one of the key current issues within this area, and that is the discussion about the role of large-scale hydropower in the provision of, in, in the meeting energy goals. And then thirdly, perhaps uh, what I'll spend most time on, some of the potential issues that could arise in this area between Canada and the United States. I guess these are th issues that are perhaps now only rumbling beneath the surface and perhaps may arise during coming years and I guess I would argue it's important to anticipate these sorts of issues that could arise uh, within the renewable electricity policy discussions and by extension within climate change policy discussions as well. So first of all, a little bit of context by talking about renewable electricity and global climate change. And I guess the um, first comment I would make is the way in which we provide electricity in the world today can often be a contributor toward, towards global climate change, towards challenges associated with global climate change. As such, we see the increased development of renewable electricity as often being a part of global climate change policies, broader global climate change strategies. And I've just pulled out a few examples there from literature, from policy. Um, the IPCC's third working group, which is in charge with the mitigation of climate change, does look at the role of renewable electricity in climate change mitigation, and in particular in the, the medium and often longer term because of the timelines associated with the replacement of electricity infrastructure often. An exa international example, the G8's communique from uh, Glen Eagles, their meeting in the United Kingdom last year, um, amongst other things, they talked about the importance of renewable energy as part of a climate change strategy and committed themselves to the development of renewable energy particularly and clean energy broadly. And of course, the use of that term alternatively raises a whole host of other issues. And a number of individual countries have identified that the development of renewable electricity is an important part of their broader climate change mitigation strategy. The United Kingdom brought out just recently its... Um, program, climate change program, where it gets into the details of what it hopes to do. The first chapter is on energy supply and within that reflections upon electricity supply in particular. So I, I'm, my premise is starting from the fact that development in policy about renewable electricity has direct ramifications for broader ideas about how climate change policy develops. The other context is the geographical context. and. Uh, Joining my colleagues in graphical challengeness, I have a rather dense diagram there played with the washout feature on Microsoft and PowerPoint as well, just to provide you with a little bit of information. Of course, I don't need to tell any of you that Canada and the United States both generate electricity, and in the bottom left-hand corner, you have the fact that the United States is a, a larger generator of electricity than Canada, roughly proportionate to the differences in economy and population there. 
Um, another thing that uh, a couple of other things I should just flag from here are the differences in which electricity is generated. The bottom right hand corner, the United States mix, where coal is particularly important in, in electricity generation, nuclear and natural gas are other significant contributors. Canada in the top left hand corner has a very different mix. Hydropower is quite significant and coal and nuclear are, are next and, and somewhat down the list. And of course, those national figures also mask regional variations within that as well. Another thing I should say is that notwithstanding the fact that electricity, unlike perhaps other widgets, is not a substance or good that is easily traded because it's most economically efficient to use it when it's immediately created or generated or transformed, and equally there are losses associated with its long distance movement. Nevertheless, even though Trade has been a modest part of each country's electricity portfolio. About 6 or 7 percent of Canada's electricity is ultimately exported to the United States, and less than 1 percent of the U.S.'s electricity is ultimately exported to Canada. It still is a significant amount in terms of dollar values, in terms of kilowatt hours, megawatt hours, and particularly between areas like the <coughs> British Columbia and Washington, Oregon, Manitoba and North Dakota, Minnesota. Ontario and Michigan, New York, and Quebec and a number of areas uh, bordering Quebec, New York and New England states in particular. And anyone who uh, lived in Ontario, Ontario in 2003 or parts of the United States Northeast recognized that there are important interconnections between the physical systems as well <laughs> as the blackout revealed. And there are many institutional relationships as well with regard to the, the, the regulatory bodies that try to manage the, that try to, that successfully do, manage the supply of electricity and the reliability of the systems. And there are many links between the two countries. Moving on to the second part to talk about some of the issues that are arising with respect to renewable electricity across the Canada-US border. And I think th one of the largest ones right now is the discussion about the appropriate role of large-scale hydropower, and more specifically, how large-scale hydropower can meet energy and environment goals in both countries. And I guess in a nutshell, many in Canada argue that large-scale hydropower with low emissions has a potential to address air quality challenges and therefore it should be top of the list or near the top of the list of any policies that try to advance sustainability goals in energy systems. Alternatively, many in the United States contest this view and argue that large-scale hydropower has a range of social and environmental consequences which means that it may not advance sustainability to the amount, to the degree that others argue and therefore perhaps it should not be given as much attention as in particular the so-called new renewables like solar PV and wind power and others. This debate has played out across the international border and we've seen politicians, we've seen representatives of the business communities engage each other about this with the Canadian government, with uh, Quebec companies amongst others arguing that at the state level, the US state level, Renewable portfolio standards should accommodate all sorts of hydropower. We've seen the Canadian ambassador, successive Canadian ambassadors, arguing that the development of any RPS at the federal level in the U.S. should accommodate Canadian hydropower as well. Alternatively, we've seen many uh, groups in the United States contest this idea. I've got a couple of uh, symbols up there from groups in, for example, Vermont where Vermont will, during the coming years, have to reconsider its energy supply as a long-term contract with Quebec Hydro is expiring, and also from Minnesota, where there has been much debate about the role of Manitoba hydro, uh, hydropower exports as well. And this debate continues today. The debate comes down to, in many ways, the discussion about what is renewable, what is green, what is clean, what sort of electricity is, is preferable, what sort of electricity should be encouraged. And notwithstanding the efforts of a couple of, of many organizations across Canada and the United States, and I've got the symbols up there of um, Terra Choice, a uh, consulting service in Canada that runs the Environmental Choice Program, and Green E in the United States, notwithstanding efforts of groups like those, there are still many different perceptions, many different answers as to what is 
green, what is clean, what is renewable. And indeed, the particular choice of the term goes a long way towards de uh, determining or revealing the particular position as well. The CEC, and this is in the sense of the NAFTA CEC, did a review a number of years ago and found that there was, in terms of how articulated in legislation, a lot of variation. Often solar and wind was accepted as renewable or green, <laughs> but there was much more debate, as I've already alluded to, hydropower and biomass as well. The database of state incentives for renewable energy has found that there are 299 different rules, regulations, and policies for renewable energy in the United States. I won't unequivocally say there are 299 different definitions of renewable energy, but I'm cautiously confident there are a large number of differences across the United States. So what? Why does that matter? Well, it could lead to the kinds of disputes that I've already alluded to and talked about briefly uh, between Canada and the U.S. with respect to large-scale hydropower. And it also could, could lead to disp disputes about how different jurisdictions, particularly states and provinces, are crafting legislation and what they're trying to privilege or encourage or grant, uh, quote, favors to in the development of that legislation. It could lead to trade challenges in some ways because we've seen that renewable portfolio standards, as, and as has been mentioned many times in this conference with good reason, often privilege particular kinds of electricity for part of the market in a state. We will have a renewable portfolio standard for X percent, which means that X percent of our electricity market will be restricted to certain kinds of electrons. But some can test no matter how good your microscope is, electrons don't look differently on the basis of how they are generated or transformed. That is, the end product of the electricity is the same, and we shouldn't be discriminating between like goods in those ways. Others maintain, no, that's not true, because physics teaches us that in terms of electricity, we should look at the entire process. We can't divorce or separate the, quote, end product from the way in which it is generated. Indeed, my colleagues in thermodynamics chastise me when I talk about energy consumption because you can't consume energy, you simply transform it and indeed therefore need to look at the entire process. I guess my point is simply here that we could continue to have, and, and many who are looking at international law issues suggest we could continue to have debates with regard to how renewable electricity is defined and this could lead to international trade tensions under international legal regimes perhaps. So when Rhode Island says only hydro rated under 30 megawatts qualifies for its renewable energy standard, others may say that's unfair. When Arizona reserves more than half of its RPS, as it calls it an environmental portfolio standard, reserves more than half of it for solar PV, others could claim that's unfair as well. I think Barry has very nicely um, talked about this in the context of debates perhaps within the United States about how this could interfere with uh, the conduct of commerce and I'm alluding to the fact that it could rise, uh, arise internationally as well. Another potential issue coming up that I'd like to flag is the debate about so-called fixed quotas or fixed prices. I'd like to argue, as many have, that in North America, traditionally, renewable portfolio standards, that is, this notion of fixed <laughs> quotas, has been the dominant way, between these two choices, dominant way of looking at how we might encourage the uptake of renewable electricity. We've seen um, Barry reported that there were 22, and I'm glad my slide says 20 plus, there are <laughs> 22. It's not 20 plus DC, it's 20 plus comma DC uh, <laughs> renewable portfolio standards across the United States. Over the past few years, Ontario had talked about it, and we've heard PEI talk about it, New Brunswick as well. I guess what intrigues me though is that we are in seeing increasingly, modest still, but increasingly talk about fixed prices, something that has been pursued in, in Europe to a greater extent whereby we will not fix the quota, 5% of electricity by renewables, instead we will fix the price. If you build it, we will pay type thing. If you could put solar panels on your roof, we will give you X cents, X whatever currency unit there is for every unit of electricity you generate. And in particular, Ontario, 
proposed a legislation just a couple of months ago saying that they will pay 42 cents for every kilowatt hour of solar PV that is produced. And given the way the dollar is going, when I say Canadian cents, that is still a significant uh, amount of money. And 11 cents for biomass, small hydro, and wind. Now, there are some who are suggesting that this might be conceived to be some sort of subsidy. Does this prefer advantage upon Ontario solar companies who develop expertise in how to, um, how to develop solar panel devices in that sort of climate? In a few years, they export their goods to New York, and perhaps New York, United States, uh, suggests that that industry has been subsidized in that way. The precedent from the European court where uh, the German law was challenged is suggestive that maybe it is not. It, it, it is not perceived as a subsidy. However, in the Germany case, I believe it was about private sector actors doing the payments rather than the government. At this point, the Ontario Power Authority has not determined exactly how the payments will be made, but it might be challengeable in that way in the future. Other issues that could uh, raise, uh, raise debate, raise attention, are things like the international trading of tradable renewable electricity certificates. We've talked about this in this conference, and many have highlighted the fact that there are challenges perhaps of double counting, overlapping jurisdictions, and so on. Uh, very interesting work recently by Robert Howes of the University of Michigan Law School suggests that another wrinkle when it goes to the international is that these certificates may no longer be considered under GATT, but instead under GATS. That is, it's no longer a good, but a service, and it therefore may mean a whole new element of international trade reflection is appropriate. Green procurement, the way in which governments try to encourage learning by saying they will purchase green products. Uh, Pennsylvania, for example, has said that it will uh, undertake a program of green procurement, uh, including green electricity. And when it's considering offers, one thing it looks at is the location of the generating source. Some may say that that is challengeable in that we should not have um, prejudice, we should not be excluding those that are produced external to the jurisdiction. Barry Appleton, who has done a lot of work on NAFTA challenges, was commissioned by the Society of Professional Engineers in Ontario to look at a recent Ontario law, and his quote was, the government, the Ontario government, is needlessly opening itself up to significant risk of trade challenges by arguing that under the RFP, the Ontario government was only looking for Ontario-based sources of renewable electricity. And as I believe Michelle mentioned, in light of NAFTA in Chapter 11, there may be similar kinds of investment challenges as well. The purpose of the presentation was just to highlight some of the issues that may be arising, as I, the term I used earlier was rumbling below the surface, perhaps. The large-scale hydropower issue is there and is being talked about and is, is, uh, is contentious uh, at some level. But there are these other issues that, as was suggested earlier this morning, as the stakes are increasing, that is, as we move from uh, relatively modest amounts of monies to larger and larger amounts of money, more interest groups, more players may come to the table and may highlight per what they perceive to be unfairness, inconsistencies, and so on. <coughs> the nature of the issue, renewable electricity, means that it has local elements, local elements in terms of resources, local elements in terms of um, local economic development, in terms of social acceptability, and so on. But it's going forward within an international and a global framework as well. And I guess I think it's very important to try and anticipate issues that may arise so that we can reap the benefits of mutual learning at the international level so that we can uh, work forward and move towards a sustainable energy future. I've put my contact details up there because I would be delighted to continue the conversation obviously now, but uh, further on as well if people share these similar interests. Thank you very Thank much. You. I hope you'll forgive me for referring constantly to notes. Uh, for me, this has been a stimulating conference, but this is the end of the last session. So since I have relatively few comments about the three presentations we've just heard, I'd like to make some observations about the entire forum as well. First of all, about the failure of... Uh, the failure to address the really big question of nuclear power as a means of generating much needed electricity. Although uh, Andrew uh, did include it in a, in a long list, uh, along with cellulosic ethanol, 
And two, I'd like to say something about the North American Energy Working Group, which has made some real progress in continental energy cooperation over the past five years, and which under the aegis of the newer Security and Prosperity Partnership of North America, SPP, represents, in my opinion, the best opportunity to make a connection between the local, state, and provincial uh, and NGO initiatives we've been talking about for the past two days, and the national energy policies of Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Uh, in respect to actions that might help to address the potential problems of global climate change. Now, uh, let me point out that NAWEG, North American Energy Working Group, is not a part of NAFTA, and it has had almost no contact with, uh, with the CEC. Um, but I still think it's important. I don't believe that either NAFTA or the uh, Commission for Environmental Cooperation or Continental Energy Politics will produce a single North American energy policy in respect to climate change or uh, in respect to almost anything else so specific. I told Michelle this yesterday when we talked about her paper, and yet I'm an advocate of continentalism, and I firmly believe that we need a continent-wide response. North American energy interdependence, even beyond what uh, has been presented in the papers here, is a reality. But so is federalism in all three countries of North America, as documented uh, earlier. Now, my conclusion uh, from uh, studying the continental energy market since the early 1990s, before most people realized there could be a continental energy market, is that Canada, the United States, and Mexico uh, will definitely continue to have separate national energy policies long beyond the time when we need to act continentally to try to forestall the adverse effects that global climate change could bring. So I think that initiative will have to come from the bottom up, and that's what we've been talking about. I believe it can come through the Security and Prosperity Partnership of North America. Uh, I know something about national energy policies. I've drafted every word of three of our national energy policy documents in the United States, and I've been editor-in-chief for two others. I also recognize that no single document of this type, we've been talking about national leadership, but no single document of this type emanating only from the executive branch of the national government is actually the effective energy policy of the country. States and provinces and non-governmental organizations, energy producers and consumers, uh, not to mention many national government agencies apart from the U.S. Department of Energy, all have inputs. And it's the resultant of all these forces that I think we need to address in taking action that will make a difference. Now, uh, Ian Rowlands mentioned uh, Nayweg in his paper. I don't think you did in your oral presentation. But nobody has mentioned the Security and, and uh, Prosperity Partnership. Now, that's the fault of SPP itself, because they've been, they've been so uh, bashful. Even though the last trilateral summit in Cancun, Mexico, announced that it would be the focus of those discussions among President Fox, President Bush, uh, and the new Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper. Within the past six weeks or so, I have spoken to the energy ministers of two Canadian provinces who had never heard of either the Security and Prosperity Partnership or the North American <laughs> Energy Working Group. Well, I'll tell you something about SPP. First of all, the difference between the North American Energy Working Group, which was established in 2001, is that it is uh, made up of, of bureaucrats, mid-level bureaucrats. The SPP was assigned responsibility uh, in the names of cabinet ministers in all three countries. They were also given 90 days to come up with action, pl with action plans uh, in not just, not just the energy field, also the environment field, also transportation, also electronic communications, uh, and steel and autos. Um, and there have been workshops and there have been reports and even a document that purports to describe a North American natural gas vision, which doesn't mention environmental effects at all. But uh, the most important thing about SPP is that from the start, it has been committed by the three leaders who set it up to take account of stakeholders' opinions. Now, who is a stakeholder? Well, I think those who qualify as stakeholders will be those who speak up. The oil and gas industry has started to do so, and Alberta as a province has spoken up. Uh, but the regional groupings of governors and premiers who have been discussed here today have not 
addressed SPP, nor have the environmental uh, NGOs. And academics are only beginning to grasp the significance of the SPP concept, which is to have national government agencies and stakeholders consulting on benchmarks for the future. Now, in this environment, uh, it will be interesting to see how Barry Rabe's observation about classic distributional politics between wind and sun in RPS will play out, because both of them are privileged to declare themselves stakeholders and talk with the SPP through its website, www.spp.gov. Now, I don't expect CO2 reduction to come up on the SPP agenda anytime soon, but there are actions that could reduce those emissions that would fit into the activities of various NAWAG SPP energy subgroups. These subgroups deal with efficiency, hydrocarbons, renewables, electricity trade, oil sands, nuclear power, and so on. And stakeholders could campaign for communication between the energy and the, and the environment working groups. Uh, there, there's this stovepipe arrangement in SPP. There's an energy working group and an environment working group, and they, they don't talk to each other. That dovetails with what Stacey Vandeveer described in respect to uh, RIGI, uh, and what Simone uh, mentioned uh, about uh, uh, the, the, the wrangling among energy, uh, uh, be, uh, be, among ministries uh, in Mexico. Stakeholders could urge that federal legislators from the three countries get together. There has never been a meeting of federal legislators from all three countries in NAFTA. Uh, they meet bilaterally, but not trilaterally. They would familiarize themselves with other problems, just as governors and premiers and mayors have chosen to do. Uh, and Ian, maybe some people might then succeed in arranging federal preemption of RPS in this country to accept Canadian hydropower as a form of renewable energy, which I think they should. Now, what would you say to them? A standardized definition of renewable energy could have the same appeal as consolidating boutique fuels for the sake of efficiency, which uh, the federal government in the U.S. has tried to do. Uh, what do we want to accomplish? Uh, I'm reminded of uh, a book called The Last Hurrah, in which uh, a mayor of Boston named Frank Skeffington started out by saying, the size of a plurality is like the color of a raincoat in a storm. It doesn't really matter as long as you have one. Uh, I submit that uh, Susie, Susie mentioned that, uh, that some, of the, uh, some of the diverse appeals to, to action uh, may spur action. And I don't care whether Pemex's goal is to increase efficiency or to, or to curb uh, the release of, uh, of global warming gases. It doesn't matter whether the motivation for CAFE standards, which we badly need, is to reduce ground-level air pollution or to lessen dependence on foreign oil.